thank you so much for staying with us for another edition of All Angles. I'm Dion Jacks Millen. In this program, we are talking about nuclear energy. The Minister of Science and Technology has said Jamaica has to introduce nuclear energy or risk being left behind. He was speaking recently in his sectoral presentation in Parliament. Take a look. The International Center for the Environmental and Nuclear Sciences, ISENS, continues to play a leading role in the region by contributing to the development of the small island developing states like Jamaica with approximately 40 years of experience in the application of nuclear technology, building human and institutional capacities in the field. ISENS is also the lead institution for a regional international atomic energy agency project on building capacity and sustaining the national regulatory bodies, thus ensuring the safe application of nuclear technology across the 13 CARICOM member states. Madam Speaker, after three years of severe pandemic-related delays, I'm happy to report that the project to install English-speaking Caribbean's first grammar irradiation facility will commence in earnest this year as the final contract was signed by the head of ISENS, Professor Charles Grant, in Vienna, Austria, in March of this year. In the short term, the facility will be integral in two major international atomic energy agencies, technical cooperation projects that are of vital concern to the country in collaboration with the SRC, the Ministry of Health and Wellness. In the long term, the introduction of Gram of gamma ray technology will be applied to other segments of the agricultural and health sectors. Madam Speaker, for the last 40 years we have been leading the region with the safe use of nuclear science. We are using nuclear science in health agriculture today and in short order we will be engaging our citizens on the value that nuclear science, clean energy, could bring to our nation states. Madam Speaker, this is how we innovate our nation to empower the people. So how then do you talk about nuclear energy within the context of a small island developing state like Jamaica? Well, I did catch up with Professor Charles Grant. He is Director General of the International Center for Environmental and Nuclear Sciences at the University of the West Indies, Mona Campus. Thanks so much for talking to us, sir. We appreciate it. Good evening. Glad to be here. What a lot of people don't know is that since 1984, which is what, nearly 40 years now, there's been a small nuclear reactor operating at the center at the, at the Mona campus of the university. As simply as you can, um, Professor, can you tell us how does it work? Um, well, it's like all reactors. It's fueled with um, uranium-235. Um, the beauty of this reactor is that it's been engineered to be inherently safe. That means there's just about anything that we do cannot cause this um, reactor to go into a state of out of control. Um, so it's operated perfectly for the last almost 40 years. I have been there for 30 of them. Um, what a lot of people don't know, it was formerly fueled with weapons grade uranium, which my our team changed out in 2015 successfully. With, without any issues whatsoever and shipped it back to the States and replaced it with low enriched uranium, which is quite safe and proliferations proof, so it can't be used for weapons. You said a little bit earlier that it's, it's engineered for safety. Can you tell me what you mean? Okay, so unlike you've heard of the so-called chain reaction, this is how reactors generate energy and so on. This reactor is built that when that chain reactor, if it ever gets to the point where it starts generating too much heat, the reactor actually shuts down. So, which is an, an incredible safety feature. It has what they call a negative temperature coefficient. So if it gets too hot, instead of having a runaway chain reaction, it just shuts down. And that's because the fuel that we have is just enough to keep the reactor going. So if you heat up or have too much chain reaction, too many neutrons or more neutrons escape and the chain reaction is broken. So inherently safe. Okay. No, I know it's used in research to, to analyze various kinds of samples. Can you just explain to us a little bit in terms of what it's used for? What type of research do you do? Okay. So we largely look at the fate of trace metals in the environment. So in layman's terms, we see what's in the rocks, how that affects the soil quality, 
how that affects the plants that live and grow in it, and then what happens when animals consume it, we consume it, and how eventually this impacts on health. So we look at things from tubers, um, animal tissue, plant tissue, marijuana is quite fashionable now. So we, we look at all components of what affects and what we ingest and how that it eventually impacts on human health and the environment as well. Now, whenever we have the conversation or start a, the conversation about whether we should introduce nuclear energy into Jamaica in terms of power plants, we're always mm -hmm. referred to the, the, the center, the um, reactor at UE, mm -hmm. and the fact that, as you said, it's operated without incident for nearly 40 years. But isn't that kind of like comparing a, a handcart with a, with a heavy-duty um, trailer? I mean, can we really look at the kind of very small reactor you have at UE and say, oh, based on how this has been working, it's fine to put in power plants in Jamaica? No, no, but it is a good first start step. So the basic principles are the same. We are under no illusion that our reactor resembles a power reactor, but the principles are the same, and the principles of safety and security are also the same. The training, the levels of training, the types of staff that will be needed to run our plant are very different. We're, we're well aware of this. But many countries around the world, including the, the big five, their first steps were with research reactors. We learned the principles of nuclear on that, but we know the two are not the same. And we are under no illusion and have never pretended to be so. Okay. Do you, though, think the minister said in his sectoral presentation that if Jamaica doesn't begin to introduce nuclear power, we'll be left behind? Is that something you agree with? Um, yes, I, for a number of reasons. And, I, and I, if you don't mind, I can expand on that just a little. Please. Um, the, the facts remain. I, I'm, so let me declare my hand first off. I am a big advocate for renewable energy. However, let's be straightforward. Renewable energies have a problem with intermittence. They're up, they're down. I know battery technology is improving and new ideas for storage of um, potential energy are, are coming on. But the facts remain that we're going to be part of the fourth industrial revolution, which seems to be energy driven. We are going to need some steady base load production. Now, we can say that for the intermittence, you have things running in backup. And we do. We have a, what they call spinning capacity, where you use either LNG or whatever method of fossil fuel we're using at the moment to run as backup for when the either solar or wind drops out. However, what a lot of people fail to say is that when you're running this so-called um, spinning capacity, you're generating greenhouse gases. So technically, you're running the, the same thing twice. You're running the backup in the background to come in when the renewable drops out, but you're generating a greenhouse gas at the same time. Why not have your backup as something that doesn't generate greenhouse gas, is what I'm saying. One of the concerns is that, especially in a small island state like Jamaica, the, the concerns about safety loom even larger. So for instance, when there was the 2011 accident in Japan at the um, Fukushima plant, there were 100,000 people who were evacuated as a preventative measure. Where are we going to evacuate 100,000 100, people to? Isn't the conversation well, different in, in a small island state like Jamaica? Well, much like your comparison to handcarts and um, trailers <laughs> earlier, the reason why we're having this conversation now about nuclear technology is, what, is because of what is being offered. Um, we didn't have this conversation 10 years ago simply because the types of plants that were available commercially, and I must add here, I'm not going to go too far ahead with this, is because these plants aren't exactly available now, they've been built now. I mean, two have been built in the world in Russia and China, but I'm, I'm not quite sure about their commercial availability at the moment. Um, so these types of plants are very different in, in their philosophy. Now, what a lot of people don't know is that reactors started small, and became large by looking at, they were looking at scales of economy, trying to get the kilowatt hour price down. Now, every coin has two sides, so you get larger, price goes down, but you jeopardize safety. And what was realized after a while and why you saw the price and the construction times of these reactors going up and, and up, because to compensate for these large 
energy dense cores, you had to build in additional safety features and have these massive um, exclusion zones in the event that something happened. Now, if we look at the equation from the other side, you build from safety first and then try to get your economies of scale by building multiple of these small reactors. Uh, kind of Henry Ford um, um, production line um, philosophy. So, so, and these small cores don't have the issue of if they lose um, cooling um, power, the amount of energy locked in the fuel not sufficient to melt it. With these large cores, when the cooling, the active cooling system is lost, as it was in Fukushima, the amount of decay heat or excess energy locked in the fuel is sufficient to melt it. So we've gone back the other way. We're looking at it from the other side. We say safety first and then economy of scales. What about the issue of disposal of waste? I mean, we've spent years in the Caribbean lobbying against the movement of nuclear waste through our waters. And now if we're going to be establishing plants right here in the country, we're now going to be responsible for disposal of that waste. Doesn't that continue to be a huge problem when you're talking nuclear it, it, energy? It, it, indeed it does, Dion. We, we can't get away from it. Um, we must also face the fact that there is no free lunch. Any um, energy generation that we, we use will have waste. There are ways of dealing. There is reprocessing. I don't say that's the only answer. But we have to look at what the alternatives are. I mean, um, when you look at the energy density of nuclear fuel, I, I know it's not a perfect answer. And it's one that has that will be had when we have our national um, debate, when we bring on board all the stakeholders to come up with solutions. One of the solutions may be something that you can negotiate in your contract with the, with the um, supplier of the, of the fuel. Because in reality, if we do ever develop good reprocessing, reprocessing technology, a typical burnt out fuel rod has only used maybe 5% of the fuel that's in it. So you've got 95% of that which could be re reused. So just as with um, the solar technology that they improved in batteries, if the need comes and there is effort made, I'm, I'm sure that will be part of the solution. But to put a final point on that, I would rather to have my waste locked in a vitrified piece of glass than have CO2 spilled out into the atmosphere that we know cannot be sustained anymore. We, we can see the damage that is actually doing. You mentioned their national debate um, nearly out of time. Tell me how you think we should move forward on this issue. Well, I, I think Minister said it first in the sectoral debate. It's called a roadmap. The very first step is to get the facts. I've heard a lot about people, you know, and they, they, they're largely talking about the older technologies, which I am in agreement with a lot of what they say. But we are not talking about the same thing. So what I would, what I crave is that the, we're given time to put together the facts of the technologies that we are looking to, and that will include the hard conversations about waste, safety, security, exclusion zones, and so on, and, and have a national conversation. This cannot move forward without the blessings of the people of Jamaica. You know, a lot of en environmental groups like Greenpeace, for instance, don't support mm -hmm. nuclear energy, don't believe that this is the way to go and stress, in fact, that there should be more effort on truly clean technologies, tr renewable technologies like solar, like mm -hmm. wind. Mm -hmm. I, I, and I agree as much as that is possible, but we must also face their limitations. And, and the fact, well, we can look at the case of Germany. They, Greenpeace have locked down the reactors, but their CO2 emissions have gone up. So we have to be practical in all things. And I say it's so I'm not just saying yes blindly. The conversation must be had and the difficult topics have to be put out there. But okay. let's do it in an open and transparent way, involve the people. But most important to me is that the Jamaican people are told the truth about what it is that is being done and not speculate about reactors of 10, 20, 30 years ago. All right, and then, then let the decision be made based on the facts, not on speculation. All right. Well, we'll certainly be continuing the conversation. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. You're most welcome. And stay with us when we come back after the break. We continue our discussion. Remember our hashtag as well. It's TVJ All Angles. Soon come.